see what our participants are going to do with that. Um, we have um, in the top of your screen, um, Moshe Halbertal of the Hebrew University, and also Yotam Hotam from the University of Haifa. And so we will have uh, some con remarks by each uh, member of the panel, and then we'll have some back and forth, and also an opportunity, I hope, time permitting for anyone watching right now to submit questions through the, um, through the chat function or um, through Facebook or however you do them. Hopefully that will get to me. And without further ado, let's start off with Moshe. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me to participate in this dialogue. And I want to thank, uh, thank Philip for, for the wonderful book, really. It was a, an inspiring reading and a, and a, and a powerful reading. Uh, and I'm saying it not as a, not as a, I'm not a scholar of, of, of Chabad, and I'm, I'm a, 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 you know, clearly, and my comments are not coming from a scholarly point of view about the Lubavitcher Rebbe's work. Uh, I, I'm, I'm was always interested and a student of, of, of the works, and I've learned immensely from the book. So um, again, it's not only a, a book of learning, it's a book of inspiration in many, many ways. So thank you for all of that. Uh, from, and it's a, book, it's a book of love, actually. It's a book written with a loving attitude, uh, both towards the subject and about towards humanity as a whole. And it, it shines through every line of that. And even the footnotes don't destroy that, uh, that attitude so this is really remarkable also as a as a as a as a scholarly attitude which is not detached and and it's not the super ego talking to you from above so thank you very much i want to say a few few things about the what impressed me at a certain certain moment in the book and i want to start from the lubavitcher's rebbe uh, position on incarceration he was a he was a, a clear opponent and a, and, a, and a critique of the punitive system of the American legal order, uh, and uh, and expressed it in very powerful ways. Uh, and it was uh, and it was interesting because it's rooted in the in his conception of love that will take us to the issue of of of. Uh, uh, social, social justice and love. Um, when when he talks about incarceration, and he understands something very deep about a prison, because you you can say many things, many many horrible things about prison. Prison is throwing the throwing the criminal into you might say the state of nature again in a war of oligo against all where he's completely exposed to brutality but on the spiritual level on the on the existential level it's an act of isolation and uh, and what is the prisoner the criminal deprived of in this isolating isolating moment is the capacity to give and uh, it's interesting, a prisoner is only on the receiving end. He cannot give even to his own children. There he is locked, she or he, mostly he, uh, uh, and incapable of giving. He's deprived of uh, what defines us as human. You know, in Arabic they say, uh, karam is giving, karam is also dignity. Uh, it deprives us of what it is to be a human in the deepest form, which is the capacity to give. Or in a different way is the capacity to love. Because if we want to say, if you want to, if you put the idea of love at the center of your morality, rather than the idea of rights or the idea of obligation, you focus on giving and also you focus on attentive giving because love is always attentive. That's the distinction between being just loving and being merciful. Mercy doesn't have the attention. 
but if you love your your spouse you know that your spouse likes one and a half teaspoon of sugar in the tea it's the half teaspoon of sugar that makes the difference love is attentive so a, an attentive giving which defines us as humans and a person in that condition and the lubavitcher Rebbe articulated very powerfully is deprived of that uh, humanity and this is dehumanization dehumanization not only means being in a horrible state of treated being treated like a non-person but being deprived in that condition of uh, of the capacity to give i i want to say also another thing and that's an extension of this there's so many things in the book and about that and I think it's one of the most powerful halachot uh, in Tzedakah that the Rebbe mentioned, the Lubavitcher Rebbe mentioned and mentioned in the book, which is that a poor person is also obligated in Tzedakah. Because part of the condition of poverty, besides the lack of material, need, material resources to supply your needs, is that you're deprived in your dependency of the privilege of giving. And that's the humiliation of the poor. It's a very powerful halacha, by the way, there is a Yerushalmi, it's not mentioned here in the text, one of the Talmud Yerushalmi I love the most is how the, how the poor used to give tzedakah. They don't have anything. They used to exchange with one another what they got. That's the car, right? This idea that uh, you have to remember that uh, um, that if you want to nourish love, and being having the capacity to love is what makes us humans, is you shouldn't deprive people of the privilege of giving. And. Uh, in one of the most fascinating conversations in in the book about in the, and here is there is another feature of uh, the prison which is all life all meaningful life of individual is within the social network and when you isolate a person from the social network presumably you heighten the sense of individuality. By the way, here's the, a certain monastic fantasy, maybe a certain mystical fantasy, where your core identity is heightened by being removed. Uh, you deprive the individual of the capacity of well being and flourishing as an individual. Uh, and here, I think, by the way, one, one very fascinating moment in the book is the exchange of the Lubavitcher Rebbe with Kaddish Luz uh, about the, the kibbutz and communal life where the Lubavitcher Rebbe warns Kaddish Luz and says, look, Don in the kibbutz life, which is so beautifully celebrates communal life, you will under undermine the, the power of the community if you erase individuality. And you will undermine individuality if you deprive it of its social background. And here we come again to, to what we will call the ethics of love. So um, I, wanna, I want just to make a certain connections. I mean, all of this is embedded in a certain larger metaphysical point of view, etc. Uh, um, some of it some of it powerful, some of it paradoxical, some of it sometimes not fully coherent in many metaphysical strict sense, but that's not what matters. Uh, I think, I think uh, and this is something that comes out through the book, I want to stress it, is that Yadut being a religion of the law, and the, Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe always understood that, it puts a check towards other formations of religion, two formations of religion that are deeply, deeply uh, attached to a certain mystical paradigm, which is the religion of otherworldliness. 
Uh, now, if you are part and parcel of the religion of the law, you cannot be a, a religion of otherworldliness. And this is a feature of Jewish mysticism. As long as it's attached itself to mitzvot, it has to be this worldly mysticism, the mysticism of this world. Because mitzvah is a, a rule oriented towards amendment and repair of the world. This is why whatever mystical flight of otherworldliness, or as well another block, is the religion of interiority. I mean, there is another paradigm of religion, uh, which is very deep, both in the mystical tradition, but not only that. What mitzvah corrects, or I would say the correction of mitzvah to the mystical, you might say, natural pool, is that it blocks two possible mystical moves. One is otherworldliness, and the other one is interiority. A mitzvah is not an interior a moment, it's a moment of action. And I think, um, I think if I wanna ask, what is Jewish about Jewish mysticism? I mean, this is such a big question, and et cetera, et cetera that by, by not being capable of freeing itself from the world of Torah, Torah is a, is a mitzvah, it reoriented itself in opposition to two other paradigms of the mystical life to create this, uh, this worldly mysticism. Now, in the case of, of the thought of Chabad uh, and Hasidut as a whole, this came very much in contact with, um, with the pantheistic or the, the pantheistic tonality of God's presence in the world. Um, so these are just few comments that I um, wanted to, it's more, it's more my, I would say, initial inspiring inspiration from the book. And I would say one feature, there are books that the books that you learn a lot from, and clearly I learned a lot from the book. And the books that after you read them, they might make you a better person. And this is one of these books. It might make me, my, it might me, make me to a certain degree a better person. And, and thank you for that gift. Thank you, Moshe. That was uh, that was great. And Philip was shaking his head in approbation the whole time, as you could probably notice. Um, okay. Next, we'll move on to a lot of food for 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 thought. Um, and great. Uh, so next, we'll move on to Yotam, and I uh, and we'll see what he has to say. Yotam Hotam from the University of Haifa, and then. We'll have a little uh, dialogue based on that. So, Yotam, uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? You hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, Michael. Um, 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 thank you for having me in this uh, wonderful conference. Wonderful, weird, weird times. And um, I want to thank Philip for his great book. And also, you know, I joined Moshe with everything he said about the book. And also, I enjoyed very much uh, Moshe's talk. I wasn't sure that we'll have, you know, there will be, you know, issues that will connect us. But you know, hearing his talk, I think there are there are some issues that are uh, will be will be common uh, for both of us. I hope. So uh, my talk is in a way uh, inspired. Moshe talked about inspiration, so I start also with the fact that my talk is uh, inspired. Uh, by the opening discussion in uh, Philip's book. Now, what Philip is doing there uh, in the introduction and the first chapter is that he reads the Hasidic social vision against the background of uh, Max Weber's uh, sociology, but also re-engages with modern sociology, Weber sociology, with, uh, from the point of view of the Hasidic social vision. Now, Jonathan Grab talked about the contribution of this dual approach, dual movement, uh, to sociology and covered that rather nicely last week in the uh, session we had uh, last week. So what I would like to do is something not very uh, different, I hope, <laughs> which is to speculate on possible relations between the interpersonal love and fellowship 
uh, that is centered to Schnellson's uh, social vision and, and presented so elegantly in Wexler's, Wexler's book. And uh, so to kind of to uh, speculate on the relations between that and the concept of interpersonal uh, love in critical theory, okay? And especially in Theodore Adorno's association between love and critique. And this is where, you know, what Moshe talked about, about, you know, uh, critique of the, the fact that critique is of, uh, of social uh, structure is so, uh, um, you know, deeply connected to the concept of love, to Schneerson's concept of love is where I want also to put my finger on and to talk about that from, by you know discussing uh, Theodore Adorno's also engagement with the concept of love and the the way that you know Adorno uh, brings together love and critique. So this is what I want to talk about. So again, you know, love plays, and again, you know, Moshe talked about that, and clearly, love plays an important role in uh, Schnellson's social vision, and it refers to interpersonal communal experience that involves God, uh, what Philip calls uh, vertical relations and it is directed to the Jewish people, but uh, there is kind of a tripartite division, Torah, Israel, and, and, and uh, God. But uh, Philip also makes uh, the point, and this is an important point that Philip makes, that love applies to humanity at large, okay? And that it applies to all people as a form of universal responsibility. Uh, and there is again here a citation that I like, because, you know, it talks about that, you know, uh, the entire world, the entire world is uh, illuminated uh, by this type of interpersonal love. So this is, this is uh, the point, this is the universalistic point that uh, Felix makes, uh, Philip makes, and what is important in this uh, universalistic approach is that it demonstrates what Philip calls a theological realism of love, which means a focus on the material world, uh, you know, mysticism of this worldliness uh, on the material world and the social conditions in which we find ourselves and that need to be addressed. Uh, my point would be that regarding these aspects of love, Theodore Adorno uh, could not agree more. Okay, so I'm moving now to talk a little bit about Adorno and his, uh, his uh, uh, addressing of the concept of love. And what is especially uh, uh, interesting to me is to see how Adorno repeatedly, though not systematically, you know, but repeatedly talks not only of love, but also on how he connects love and critique. And this is clearly comes out in his writings in the 1960s. Okay, um, and there are, there are many examples for that, some examples, some examples for that from his different writings, but I want to talk about one example because, you know, I don't want to take too much time. I just want to make clear one example. This comes from his lecture, Erzim nach Auschwitz, Education After Auschwitz, a lecture from 1966, quite a famous one, that one that is used, perhaps overused in, in, uh, you know, in, um, in uh, many times. Uh, and in this specific lecture, Adorno makes a differentiation. I need to explain a little bit. He makes an ex a differentiation between two types of consciousnesses uh, or two types of people. Uh, one, he talks about reified consciousness. This is one aspect. And then he talks about uh, the other type of consciousness, which he, which he calls critical self-reflection. So he negates between the two. Now, reified consciousness, which is uh, actually a term that Adorno adopts from Lukács, is possessed by people who are uncritically, uncritically absorbed into the existing social conditions. Uh, 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 between the existing social con conditions. So uncritical, reified attitude is discussed by Adorno, and this is the point to note, in terms of love. Okay, and let me just make the quote. With this type of, this type of, of people, we are concerned, boldly, boldly put, with people who cannot love. Okay? An uncritical person, the person who cannot love, resembles for Adorno a uh, societal monad, whose coldness and indifference to the fate of others stood as a precondition uh, for the ultimate dehumanization, right, for Auschwitz, a point which he reiterates then in many other presentations and lectures. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, we have the power, power of reflection and the power of reflecting critically 
which is also thought by Adorno in the same terms of an interpersonal ability to belong, to belong to all people without exception, without exception uh, as they exist today. So there is a bringing together of love and critique in a way in which uh, the absence of the one somehow is connected uh, to the non-existence of the other and vice versa. Um, now, such a bringing together of love and critique might seem strange, but it is actually not a new theme for Adorno. Adorno publishes in 1939, uh, the year he publishes together uh, with Holkheimer, uh, the, uh, their, you know, their kind of celebrated uh, publication, um, um, The uh, Dialectics of Enlightenment. In 1939, he publishes a short essay on Kierkegaard's Doctrine of Love. Okay, and in this essay engages with Kierkegaard's uh, Leben und Walter de Liebe, Works of Love, this is a translation of this work. And obviously I can't go too deep into the uh, essay, you know, it deals with many issues there, but one main, one central issue that I want to present is how Adorno talks about Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard's theological concept of love as a critical category. Love is critical because Kierkegaard converts the Christian agape, the Christian concept of love, into social categories. And this means that loving people, for Kierkegaard, is equivalent to hostility, and I quote, hostility towards the dominating mechanisms of a society that turns human beings into a mass. So love operates, according to Adorno, as the criticism of the reification of men. And so in this sense, love is critique in so far that it aims to liberate human beings from the circumstance, circumstances that enslave them, which is the definition of critique for Adorno, for Horkheimer, for all these kind of, uh, uh, you know, for all these uh, critical theorists, for, the, you know, for this uh, gang of critical theorists, uh, 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 liberating human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. So what Adorno presents is a critique that is dependent of theology. And I would like to push this a little bit further and to call it a, a form of critical theology. And such a critical theology takes love to represent resistance, resistance to in this world, in this worldliness, resistance to the reification of human beings, or better, resistance to enslaving circumstances. Now the point, and this is the, the second point here. The point that Adorno makes is that Kierkegaard's attempt fails, okay? And I believe that this is also a point in which Adorno distances, distances himself from Christian theology in general. The reason for the failure lies in the fact that love for Kierkegaard become a matter of pure inwardness, which means that love of God is confined to the interior realm of the loving subject over and against an external world that includes other people. I don't know, we can call it a type of um, narcissistic verticality, okay? So Kierkegaard love is universal only in being a love of no one. Perhaps one, and this is Adorno, uh, I'm, I'm reading actually from my notes, perhaps one may most accurately summarize Kierkegaard's doctrine of love, this is Adorno arguing here, by saying that he demands that love behave toward all men as if they were dead. Love can then easily turn into its opposite, a universal hatred of human beings. Love, and then I don't, because of this interior, kind of this interior narcissistic verticality, love becomes demonic love. This is Adorno, a retreat to pure inwardness to the extent of exhibiting animosity towards an imagined hostile exteriority, which again, includes all human beings. So there's also a connection here to see between death and the demonic, between these two issues, which I believe Nathaniel Berman also talked about in his, uh, I don't know whether he listens now, in his discussion, uh, in his presentation last week. So the Christian love, this type of Christian love, but I believe Adorno wants to argue here, Christian love cannot fulfill its critical calling. And I believe that it is this theological problem that Adorno wishes to engage, to engage with in his own accentuation of the relations between critique and love from the 1960s, with which I kind of uh, started my presentation. 
What seems to me to be interesting is that a donor is not uh, interested in, re in, in retreating from, uh, you know, from critical theological argumentation. Uh, verticality is still important to him and critique still remains dependent of theology. What interests him is to suggest a type of theological realism that still enables critique to resist the existing conditions and to offer love of all people uh, uh, as they exist today. Okay, so perhaps I'm suggesting here an area of thought in which critical theory operates itself as a type of critical theology. Um, now, you know, I, I, I can talk a lot about how Adorno is doing that, I, I believe, and maybe we'll leave it to the discussion, uh, you know, if I'll be asked about that. Um, let me just conclude by going back to Schneerson's interpretation of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, interpersonal uni uh, universal love. If a universal love of all people, all people as they exist today, translates into a critique of modern conditions, and I think, you know, Moshe talked a little bit about that, as Adorno seems to suggest, we may see in the Hasidic ethos a type of critical theology that remains a critical love that remains true to its critical calling, or at least valuable resource, a valuable resource, resource for what Adorno has in mind. Uh, this is not to say that we are dealing here with, you know, with, uh, with similar understandings of verticality, or horizontality. There are many differences that we can talk about, but I do think that it, it offers a possible uh, a possibility to reflect on some areas of agreement. Uh, uh, which may also invite, uh, uh, you know, the breaking of the boundaries between uh, modern religious and modern secular thought that is also central uh, to Philip's overall argument. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Yotam. Um, well, it's one thirty, so we have some time for uh, a little conversation and I'll ask any of the participants who are watching if they have any questions to put them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat now and hopefully we'll, I suspect we'll have some time to get to questions if there are any. Uh, Moshe, did you want to um, have any, have a response for a moment because we yes. have some time to enjoy. Sure. Thanks, thanks, thanks for your time. This was really uh, illuminating in many ways and uh, Adorno's critique of uh, the way I formulate the Adorno's critique of Kierkegaard's conception of love has to do with uh, this worldliness um, orientation that blocks the movement of interiority as a, as, a, as a religious attitude as a whole. In my view, it comes from uh, through Chabad, it comes through the, the centrality of mitzvah as an as a orienting category to the world. Uh, in Adorno, it comes from his social, social concern and understanding. So this is a, a, clearly a very deep point. One thing that came to mind as you were talking is that if you ask uh, yourself, what is exactly the attitude of love? Uh, in the way it's understood in the tradition and other things, and it relates to what Yotam says. Love is, a, is an uninstrumental relationship, right? You, you love the other, or you, rec you recognize the other um, as, a, as a loving, as a subject of love when you don't relate to the other as an instrument. Uh, and being in the grip, you, you know, you always ask when, uh, you know that friendship is betrayed when you realize that a friend has seen you merely as an instrument for his own advancement. It could have been reciprocity, but reciprocal, but it, it, it wasn't love. It wasn't genuine friendship. Um, now, what's powerful about this, and here is a kind of a critique of the Weberian um, world of, of um, technocratic instrumentalization was this kind of iron cage because the attitude of love means not treating either yourself or others as instruments. Now, I, I, I clearly you can, and this is essential to Yadut, to, to, 
to the Lubavitcher's Rebbe thought, you cannot love God without loving humans, because humans are loved by God, but also uh, they are, they represent features of God. So rejecting humanity means rejecting God. And from the perspective of, of, uh, of that thought, you cannot love humans without loving God, because what makes humans lovable is features, is the divine features in them. So, uh, so there is that, that very powerful element. Uh, but I wanna say something that relates to, to being human and being loving. I think our capacity to transcend instrumental relationships, meaning our capacity to free ourselves from the grip of fear and pleasure, right? Of punishment and reward. If we have such capacity, it's the transcendent in us, right? It's where we transcend, uh, you might say, our initial conditions, right? We, we come to the world with a grip of immense fear of the world and also seeing the world as a resource for our pleasure. And therefore we tend to instrumentalize the world. And um, I would say the inner growth of, of a person as a person is the capacity to transcend that grip, which is done through love. And this is why, um, um, you know, in, in, in Vaikra Rabba, where, where it says, this is a way where the poor approach the givers, zachi uh, uh, become merit, become merit, have merit through me, meaning uh, um, um, The, 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 the capacity, the other, the, the receiving one is actually enabling you, is a giving one, because he's enabling you to transcend that grip of instrumentalization. And that's a, that's a deep cyclical conception that is intertwined in the discussion. I wanna say just another thing, uh, and here, uh, um, um, maybe, you know, if we talk about love, there is a, you know, the rabbi say, uh, one feature of the book is a, a certain particular, I would say, harsh description of the secular world. Uh, um, um, as if, um, now, clearly, the, the idea of not treating people as mere instruments uh, that comes with the centrality of the concept of dignity of humans, right, in the Kantian tradition, etc., is really a way out of, of that paradigm, of the Weberian paradigm, or harsh uh, perception of the disenchanted iron cage. Uh, but there is something, when you, uh, when you talk about love rather than dignity, is that you're willing to uh, accept and relate to the person's vulnerability uh, as, a, as an inherent feature of his being, or her being, rather than the autonomous self. And uh, I think, by the way, if I want to make a connection, and it will be um, a slightly complex connection in modern Jewish thought, Still, the, the non-Hasidic greatest modern Jewish philosophy, philosopher, Hermann Cohen, I don't think there was a, a greater Jewish philosopher, modern Jewish philosopher, than Hermann Cohen. And when he, uh, uh, and when he uh, wanted to use the category of compassion, which is very, it's in the vicinity of love, chemla, uh, uh, and um, and one thing that compassion orients the, yourself to the, the other has to do with accepting your vulnerabilities and the other vulnerabilities, uh, which is, it's not captured by 
the category of treating the other as an end in itself. So, um, so I just wanted to bring in to the discussion following um, Yotam's comments, uh, the problem of love, not the problem, but the, the, the marker of love is, a, is breaking the cage of instrumentalization. There's something deep to the attitude of, of love, uh, which is a, is a very powerful idea, uh, both expressed in, in these texts and others. I'll, I'll, may I ask a couple of words, uh, Michael? I mean, okay. Uh, firstly, thank, thank you very much, Michelle. I mean, so so many ideas and so many comments and, and so many kind of interconnectedness between great ideas. And you know, I, I, just let me say something about you know one thing that you say and that I want to pick up here, and, and that you know you cannot li uh, love God without loving human beings and so on and so forth. And here I, I want to make the point from the you know from from the point of view of uh, you know of um, uh, Adorno's critique of Kierkegaard. Now, obviously Adorno uh, and Kierkegaard Adorno doesn't Adorno agrees with you, and he says that Kierkegaard agrees with you. The point that he makes, and this is a very interesting point in his article, is that there is a differentiation between you know loving humans and loving the humane. Okay. Right. Now, loving the humane for Kierkegaard means loving God, loving the image of God, seeing the image of God in one's self and forgetting other human beings because they're all the same. They're only the image of God. So what you actually love is the humane, which means that you love God and you forget to love other human beings, so love human, uh, to, to love other human sure. beings, just because you love the humane, i.e., which means that you actually in a, sure. in a direct connection between the self and God, when other human beings are just an instrument for right. this direct relations. So it right. kind of makes this, this differentiation, and with, with the help of this differentiation, it makes the point that what happens to Kierkegaard is that because other human beings are an instrument for the loving of the humane, which means loving of the image, uh, loving the image of God, is that you know he kind of turns, he kind of flips sure, to sure. hatred of other human beings. Sure, so that is a differentiation yeah. that you know that is very interesting to me too. You right. know the point that he makes, and probably it's quite quite you know um, a, a radical one. You know right. concerning uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, th this was actually my... Yeah, I, I just want to make a po point about that because, uh, because there is, a, there is a, a, a challenge which I'm struggling with reading the book, reading... I, I'm, I am uh, very uh, theologically and existentially very distant from pantheism or, and modes of pantheism, but that has very... Uh, not much to do with our conversation, but one worry that I always had uh, reading these texts is that the flattening of pantheism, of the, of the, because everything is God or everything is an image of God, then where is the individuation? And after all, this is the point that Adorno makes, right? Exactly. We love humans, not quite humans, but the symbols of God, etc. Exactly. Et and are all the same. But just to say something theologically still, uh, one feature of God as one is that uh, is unique, right? It's not only one, but unique, yachid. And saying that everyone is in the image of God is actually saying that he's not only one, because one is an erasure of plurality, but is yachid that there is something unique about that person, right? And we have to, we have to think about what does it mean that uh, 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 um, the morality of pantheism is a very complex project. And you, I think, touching something very deep about this issue. I mean, I'm trying to theologically to salvage uh, uh, pantheism from its, from its erasing erasure mode, right? Because after all, since we are all in God and God is one, we are all one, where, 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 is, where is the person? You love humanity, but you don't love humans. 
uh, and love is actually an individuating force. I think part of the uh, people are deprived of love, children who are deprived of life, they get rights maybe, but getting rights doesn't make you, uh, uh, being loved means being a, an individuating uh, focus of someone's concern about the issues that are completely not captured by the general idea of dignity and, and rights, right? You, when you love someone, you care that, that he missed an opportunity, etc. All the pain that we have from, uh, from very individual aspirations, dreams, disappointments, etc. So um, I think the point you're making of the encounter of Adorno with Kierkegaard is a general concern with very powerful thing of uh, creating social ethic around, uh, around semi-pantheistic modes uh, with the erasure or the erasure capacity of oneness. Uh, but to salvage it, maybe you have to go through the idea of uniqueness, right? Not echad, but yachid. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to work through that, uh, that question. But it brings something, I think, very deep about the about about this um, mystical theology and and uh, and social mysticism that are based on this ontological ethos right okay um hi gentlemen we are um going to try to wrap up around 150 i did have one question in our last few minutes which i guess brings us back to reality for a moment although that was fascinating and the question is um I'm paraphrasing a little bit from one of the, someone who's watching the conference who says, who asks, how can one attract or achieve, um, get, so to speak, or have the love of another human or of God when he or she does not currently have it? How does one go about finding love not in an instrumental way, but in a more in a in a um, spiritual way, I guess, or maybe even in a in a tangible way. That's a hard question, I guess. This is really a hard question. How do you get to the madrega of uh, uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, of love, right? Being being capable of of love yourself, right? And uh, uh, some of it has to do with just experiencing love of others uh, to you or towards you, etc. But uh, but I think you love the things you invest in. Right, you love the things that you're investing and you care for, and caring for comes with, with, uh, in the way parents grow to love their children. Uh, it's really part and parcel with caring, actively caring. Um, so. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, what is it in the world? And I'm sure every one of us have it. What is in the, in the world that we care for, not because we earn from, not because we are rewarded by? What is it that we, and, uh, and we will find instances of that in very powerful way. It could be love of a country, it could be love of an idea, a value, uh, and other things. And you extend from that. Should I, in what way I can extend that? Um, by the way, I just want to say something, and this is a, an afterthought that has to do with incarceration and love. One thing that troubled with me, troubled me, troubles me in the penal, existing penal system 
And it's lack of the concept of kapara, atonement, because we know that punishment in the, in the Jewish tradition is deeply connected to atonement. We are coming to Yom Kippur. And, uh, and if I had to design the criminal system, I would bring back the criminal to the court after the criminal has served his punishment and embrace him back into society. There is a huge ritual of entry to the prison and no ritual of exit. And this is something deeply wrong, right? Because it lacks the category of atonement. So you say, I would have brought the prisoner. I mean, I would do away with so much of the prison anyhow, but whatever is left of it, I would have brought the prisoner back into the place that sent him to prison and say to him, you know, you are, you are now, uh, as, as, the, as the Talmud says, right? since he's punished, he's your brother. Um, that's a very, um, that's, that's something we have to remember when we think about reform of the punishment system that the Lubavitcher Rebbe thought so much about, but we lack that. Uh, we lack that capacity of embracing back, uh, and that, which means that now you're not stigmatized. You have, uh, there, is, there is finality to, there is finality to punishment, right? Uh, by way of coming back. Um, but that's just a, another thought that is, comes from from uh, the Lubavitcher's reflections on incarceration and the lack of the category of atonement in present day retributive discourse. Mm. Fascinating. Uh, we have a comment about, I'm going to give I, your- I just go back to the question about love. Um, yeah, I'm going to give uh, your time, the, your, I'm give your time, I'm going to give you the last word on that, on that question. Thank you. We have a comment about the Hasidic concept of dual perspectives by Tamar Ross that and pantheistic love, but we'll save that for for perhaps later today. There may be a breakout room at the end of the session. We'll, we'll, Jonah will speak to that. But yes, please, Yotam, finish us up with the response to that very um, um, well, person. I, I don't know. Thank you for giving me the last word. I don't know. That's, that's, that's a, no, no, over it's, my shoulders. I don't know. Oh, um, well. <laughs> uh, just to go back to the question, I mean, I mean, they are just making the typology here. There are usually two answers to this question. You know, one answer is that love is in, embedded in every human being, you know, just there, you're born with each part of your structure, um, you know, and you, you need to activate that. It's uh, automatic or immediate, actually, uh, and, uh, and even autonomic, if to use a word that is used today in, in, the, in, in the car industry, it's autonomic, and you just need to activate it in one way or another, so it's there. Uh, so that's one answer, and the the other answer usually goes the other way around and says that it has to do you no, know, and this is something that Moshe talked about it. It has to do with the visiting of the other, okay, being with the other, visiting with the other. It has to do something. It comes, it begins with, it comes from. Uh, that doesn't necessarily negate the first answer, but in this typology you have, and I think this uh, this typology also applies to what I know of you know the Greek answers, the Greek concepts of love. Either it's agape or uh, or eros or uh, philia, you know. It also applies to this different. You can you can play with these different concepts of love when you think about, you know. Either you are talking about social uh, social kind of visiting the other, or you're talking about uh, something that is. So those are the, the the two answers. Now I use the term visiting because I think this is this is a way in which the term critique is also important to the understanding of love and the connection between love and critique. Uh, what I mean is that uh, if you shift just, you know, I don't know, as, as, a, as, as a play, as a language play, you shift from thinking about cri a critique and the critical from, you know, English, say, to Hebrew, to the term we call it, then the term is more, uh, you know, is more, uh, is enriched. The term itself, critique, uh, because it is enriched with the concept of visiting, of bikul. And this is, this is a point that I think was also made by Levinas in, in, in different contexts. But uh, uh, if you think about, uh, you know, critical not as, a, you know, not only as an analysis of something or understanding of something, but also as being with the other, 
uh, uh, then you, you can see how I think this applies very beautifully to also what Adorno uh, wants to make, and and even if probably he didn't think in terms of Hebrew. Gentlemen, um, thank you. That was uh, fascinating, and I have a feeling we'll be watching this again, or at least I will be um, on the replay. Um, Jonah is going to hop back on at at two p.m. So we have a ten minute break now. Uh, at two p.m. we're going to have. Um, Moshe Idel from Hebrew University, excuse me, Hebrew University speaking on adversity as a growth opportunity. And um, so we've been watching Social Vision and Love. Thank you, Moshe Halbertal and Yotam Hotam. That was very much. quite, Thank quite you very special. Much. Thanks, guys. And Thank um, you. we'll Thank see you. you. We'll see you um, stick around or we'll see you later on. And Jono should be back in a few minutes. Thanks. Unfortunately, I have to go because they're closing my office. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know why. You know, they're closing the university, so I am. And, uh, I, and unfortunately, okay, well, unfortunately, I have to go. I won't be able to listen to Moshe because I have to uh, teach soon. No problem, guys. That was great. Thank you. Good. Yep. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Good to see you, Philip. Good to see you, Philip. Thank you.